Okay, hello, welcome back to another video on the Will Taylor Chess channel. The reception on my last video about the opening invented by Emery Tate was insane, and I asked at the end of the video whether you guys want a tutorial on said opening. The feedback was awesome, literally thousands of you said yes, and that is why I have spent the last few days creating a comprehensive guide to the Tate variation. For those of you who didn't watch my last video, the Tate variation is an opening played against Aliekin's defense that arises in this position. Today, we're going to cover Black's potential response Responses in this position and how to attack with this insanely positioned rook. But first, we have to look at how to get to this position, any deviations up until this position, and what to play against those. So, without further ado, let's get into the tutorial. So, the take variation is played as white, and we are going to open with the move e4. Now, this is a variation to be played against Aliekin's defense, which occurs after the move knight to f6. By no means are you going to see the move knight to f6 every game you play. However, in the games in which you do, there is quite a strong likelihood that you will end up in the Tate variation because what we are going to do is make a lot of forcing moves that leave black with very little options. The first of these moves is e5 going straight for that knight and forcing it to move otherwise it will be taken by the white pawn. Here an overwhelming 94% of all players in the Lee Chess database play the move knight to d5 which is the move that we are looking for. However, before we go through that, let's look at the sidelines. The first move that I want to prepare you against is the move knight to e4, the Mokele Mbembe variation. Here you're going to play the move d4 and observe that the knight is only one move away from being entirely trapped. If, on the other hand, your opponent is somewhat prepared and plays the move e6, controlling the g5 square with the queen and thus giving the knight a square to escape to, you're going to play the zesty move knight to h3. Now knight to h3 here also controls the g5 square such that if this knight tries to retreat we can just take that. The queen can obviously not take because then this bishop will take the queen. So given that f6 here is a terrible move, I mean it completely weakens the king to this queen check, your opponent is kind of forced to play the move h6. Now I am a huge fan of the line here where you play f3 regardless, kick the knight to g5 and then step back to f2 with your own knight which effectively is threatening the move f4 forcing that knight back to the h7 square. I mean, you know, all the other squares uh, would be controlled and this knight will sit here impotent, useless on h7. There's not actually much black can do to prevent this idea of f4 kicking the knight back. If they try to play the move f6 to get the knight back to f7, then you can take, you can always come in here uh, with the queen after the move f4, of course, and this, this is gonna be a terrible position for black. So now you're prepared if your opponent tries to play the Mokele and Bembe variation with knight to e4. However, there is another playable move that isn't knight to d5, and that is knight back to g8. This is known as the Brooklyn variation, and it has been played by some top grandmasters, Magnus Carlsen included. Given that you're not going to be playing Magnus Carlsen, we'll spend a little less time on this move because it's not very hard to understand why, logically speaking and principally speaking, using two moves to end up in the same starting position as black is not the best idea. If somehow you do end up in this position, what you're gonna do is just play the move d4, claiming the full center here, and after d6, you can go for knight to f3 here. If your opponent is not a grandmaster and has played this, they have likely developed their knight, gotten scared, and run away instead of actually having prepared something here, which means they're quite likely that after takes takes to fall for this trap where f6 is played. You've just bullied around their knight with the move e5. They want to do the same thing. They want to kick your knight with the move f6, but I'm sure many of you realize there is the move queen to h5 check here, forcing the move g6, and you can then sacrifice that knight such that after the pawn takes, you can pick up this rook on h8. So we've got the non-trivially stupid deviations out of the way. In this position, we can now move on to knight to d5 here, the main line. This is what you'll see almost every single time you see knight to f6 and you play e5 yourself. Knight to d5, 94% of people play it, and those who don't either really know what they're doing or have no idea at all. From here, to get to the tape variation, we're going to play another super forcing move, and that move is the move c4, attacking this knight yet again. And here, 95% of people play the move knight to b6, which is exactly what we want to see in this position. Another move that I might as well quickly go over is the squirrel variation, with knight to f4 here. I mean, this is an absolutely awful opening, but it does have a pretty funny name, so you might find some stupid people like myself playing this opening. Here, you're just gonna play the move d4, claiming the full center here. I mean, just look at all of this space you got over here and unveiling the attack onto the knight with the dark square bishop. After the very natural move, knight dropping back to g6, you can actually play the best move, h4, going straight for the neck. You do not give this knight a moment's rest, and after your opponent goes for e6, vacating this square for the knight, you play h5, kick it to that square, 
and then just play like knight c3. In this position, you end up with the most dominant space advantage on the king side and just in the center, and even, you know, edging towards the queen side that I've ever seen. It's just a dream position. You get super rapid development. Bishop can come out, bishop can come out, knight to f3. You can probably get away with queen d2 and castle and queen side. You could also probably just play king to f1. I mean, it's a brilliant position. Unfortunately, we have to wake up from that dream position and go back to the real world, where your opponent is 95% of the time going to play the move knight to b6. Now, the move d4 is actually the most common here, but that is not what we're going to go for today. We are playing the Tate variation. We are being even more aggressive. We are playing a4. And if black plays some seemingly innocuous move, like, for instance, pawn to g6, trying to fiancasse this bishop and castle king side, quite a common idea in Aliakin's defense, we can then play a5, completely trapping this knight. Therefore, our move pawn to a4 poses a problem for black. How are you going to stop this knight from getting trapped? Well, there are two popular ways of doing this. The first being the brute force, let me just play a5 myself as black. However, this of course allows us to go rook a3 and play into the take variation, which we will get onto. The other of the popular ideas is the move d6 here, which after the move a5 allows the knight to sneak back into d7. You should not be disheartened if your opponent goes for this variation because while you don't get to play rook a3 and the super early rook lift, you do get to play a very exciting move here, pawn to e6. This completely sacrifices the pawn. I mean, f takes e6 is just a completely free pawn. It attacks the knight and also the weak f7 pawn, so black is effectively forced to play that move f takes e6. Here, we're going to play the calm d4 and just Take a step back and look at the position. White has free and active development. Bishop d3, knight f3, knight c3. This dark square bishop can go wherever it wants along this diagonal. Castles is possible. Maybe this f pawn runs. Maybe the h pawn runs. There is a plethora of super rapid developing ideas for white. Let's take a look at black, specifically their bishops. Okay, let's look at this one. No legal moves here and uh, no legal moves here. There are no legal moves for the queen. This knight can't really come out anywhere useful. I mean, it can go to f6, of course, but black has this super clunky, annoying center where they will not be able to develop very fast at all. Fundamentally, that is the point of sacrificing this pawn here. When you force the f pawn to go in front of this pawn on e7, you know, black cannot play the move e5 or even e6, which is quite necessary to allow fluid play in the center. If your opponent goes for the move e5 here, trying to open up that center and get some dynamic play through it, you're going to play the move bishop to d3. And funnily enough, if they try and get rid of this double pawn in the center, maybe taking here to then play the move e5, that looks great, right? Let's play pawn takes. Well, here you have the beautiful move queen to h5, I'm sure you've realized, and after g6, you can sacrifice your queen because, of course, let's take with the queen and not with the bishop. It's more flashy. After the h pawn recaptures, we then have bishop takes g6, checkmate. If instead of taking this pawn, however, they play something more sensible like the move g6 here, what we're going to do is just push past with d5, and after bishop to g7, we're going to develop principally, basically, until they castle. Knight to c3, kingside castles, and if you're feeling a bit zesty, a bit spicy, we can lash out with the move h4 here. Um, or we can go for knight f3 and go for the more principled development and castle kingside ourselves. The bonus of the move knight to f3 immediately means that you can try and go to g5 and then get into e6 with your knight, which would obviously fork the rook and queen. However, if your opponent goes for something a little more concrete here with the move g6, trying to fianchetto this bishop and castle kingside, you can actually play h4 straight away. If they carry on with their plan of bishop g7, you can play h5, carrying on, lashing out, no mercy here. And if they make the mistake of castling, you can then take inwards, open your h file and attack this black king. There's even ideas of rook to a3 and rook to h3 here where you can double up. The queen can get involved. I mean, these pieces are all stuck over here. The king is here with basically no protection against this h file. They're going to lose this game. So in a short summary, broadly speaking, if they play this move d6, we are going to kick this knight back to d7, play e6, sacrifice this pawn, jam up their center, and then play d4. And we're going to try and get the bishops out. We're going to try and attack this king. And if they go for this g6 idea, we're going to want to play h4, h5, try and break it open and leave all these pieces in jail behind a horrible pawn structure. Finally, we can move on to what happens if they try and stop your threat of a5 by playing a5 themselves. We can, of course, play rook to a3, the Tate variation pioneered by Emery Tate in 1991 against a man named Manfred Herfel. Um, my previous video covers that if you want to go and check it out. Finish watching this one first, though. Give me the watch time. Thank you. 
Um, and yeah, once you reach this position, you are in for even more fun. We're going to go through the three most common replies from Black here and how to get super fun attacking and in many cases winning positions from this. Those moves are in no particular order, knight to c6, d6, and the move e6. I think it makes sense to look at the most popular reply first, so that means we are starting with the reply d6. Across all three responses, the idea, generally speaking, remains the same, and that is to play the moves d4 and rook across to g3. So keeping this vague idea in mind, if your opponent here plays the move d6, we are first gonna take, and if they recapture, we are gonna play the move d4. With d4, we claim the center, we free up the dark square bishop for some potential attacking ideas, and it's just all round a lovely move to play. Your opponent here will likely be looking to castle, trying to get their king safe before exploiting your early rook lift. As they've already played the move a5, and queenside castling would require another four moves, getting all these pieces out of the way and then castling, they're probably going to play bishop e7 and try and castle kingside. If they do play bishop e7 here, I want you guys to play rook to g3 straight away, immediately putting pressure on that weak g7 pawn. Now, while your opponent can play a move like knight c6 here, allowing you to take on g7, and then there are some fun complications there, generally speaking, you'll probably see them castle, which is one of the best moves, defending this pawn with the king. Here, your game plan is going to be making the most of your position's proclivity for super rapid development. You want to play the move knight to f3, here and then generally speaking you're going for bishop d3 knight c3 kingside castling very quickly and attacking with this rook that is already situated on the g-file if black plays this pretty much perfectly as they have done so far the stockfish evaluation here is around 0.0 which means generally speaking an even game it can be incredibly imbalanced but it means there are equal winning opportunities for both however any attacking player with a brain is going to want to try and play white here and use this rook. If, however, after they play d6 and you take, they decide to take back with the c pawn instead of the e pawn, things change a little bit. Initially, it's business as usual playing d4 and after a move like knight to c6, playing rook to g3. However, the difference here is that while before black's bishop had the ability to go to e7 and then castle, now, I mean, this, this little pawn chain here makes that quite difficult. And so that might lead them to try and fianchetto this bishop going on for this weak diagonal here and then castle their king kingside. That's why you'll see in this position a lot of players playing the move g6. However, when we see g6, you guessed it, we play the move h4 straight away. Bishop g7, we want to play knight to f3 and if they castle... We then just play h5, trying to open up this rook and use both of them to attack. So, broadly speaking, we've covered the ideas when they play d6 here. Now, if they play the move e6, trying to exploit your rook for being on a3 with this dark square bishop unveiling this attack here, what should you do? You guessed it, you want to play rook to g3, coming all the way across, placing your rook on this beautiful square that's just weirdly unassailable somehow. However, there are some super interesting lines when they play e6 rather than d6. I'm just going to show you one of them here. If they go for knight c6, you want to play knight c3. d6 here, we want to take and if they try and take with the bishop with tempo on your rook, then we can now take g7. This is a perfectly reasonable thing for black to have allowed, however, because now queen to f6 attacks our rook, and we go back to g3. This is really interesting because, of course, we are sacrificing the exchange, and if your opponent takes here, we want to take back with the h-pawn, and this is, this is a great position for white. Black wants to castle queenside well away from this open h-file and the potential attacking ideas there, so they're going to play a move like bishop d7. We're going to go for knight to f3, they're going to castle, and here we're going to play d4. This is just one example of a line, but in this position, we have a great claim on the center. We have a dark square bishop, and our opponent doesn't have any dark square bishop. We are threatening the idea of bishop to g5 immediately, skewering that queen uh, to that rook there. It's just a super nice attacking position. We're going to have bishop to f4. Um, and basically, the fact that your opponent doesn't have a dark square bishop is going to make yours a lot stronger. This open h file as well makes for some nice attacking ideas. The knights can potentially jump forwards, and the king can probably find safety amongst these f and g pawns here. Generally speaking, however, if they go for e6, it is just about playing rook to g3, getting your move d4 in, and then there are quite similar ideas if they try and fianchetto here, going for the move h4, h5. It's kind of similar to d6. Generally, because if they haven't played d6 already, they'll probably transpose into a similar line by playing d6 soon after you play d4 they want to attack this big center and so they're, they're generally similar lines finally we're going to have a look at the tape variation followed by the move knight to c6 and in this position you guessed it you're going to want to play d4 if your opponent goes for d6 now which a lot of aliakim defense players will they have been taught to go over here to b6 with the knight and then play d6 chipping away at this center we now have the move e6 again this pawn sacrifice idea works even though the knight isn't on d7 because if the bishop takes here we can then play the move d5 
knight, forking the knight and the bishop and leaving us in a winning position. That means after the move e6, they're pretty much forced to take with the pawn. We are then of course gonna play the move rook to g3 as per usual, and this is the exact position from the tate Herfel game. Now, if they try and reroute a knight, for instance, or place anything on d7 for that matter, let's say bishop d7, there's actually queen h5 here, keeping an eye on this queen h5 idea whenever you've drawn this f pawn towards the center, and after g6 by force, a rook takes, if they take, it is checkmate here. Now, realistically speaking, your opponent's probably not going to put something on d7. It's just good to stay aware of this queen h5 idea. If they try something more sensible like the move e5, we're going to want to play d5. And then after knight d4, we're going to want to play bishop to d3. Bishop to d3 here is a slight improvement on the game Tate versus Herfel. He actually played bishop to e3 in this position. However, bishop to d3 is slightly better. There is this insane line after g6 knight f3 and then knight back to f5 guess what we do here we don't even move the rook instead we play knight to g5 and if you take the rook we don't even do anything exciting with this knight we just take back the game is almost already over because of this threat of bishop takes g6 check here if the pawn recaptures then there is going to be rook takes h8 and so motivated by trying to protect that rook your opponent is likely going to play bishop to g7. Here there are many winning moves, but my personal favorite is rook takes h7. And if they take back with the rook, you play bishop takes g6. And there's a pretty sweet sequence that if the king tries to run to d7, we can actually go queen to g4 check. The only move being for the pawn to block, and then we can of course take that with the queen and deliver checkmate. Now, that was a lot of information to take on board from this position and leading up to this position, so I'm going to give you guys a sort of bullet point list of the main ideas to keep in mind. First of all, play d4 and rook g3 when convenient. If you can play the move e6 and force black to somehow recapture with their f pawn, generally speaking, do it. If your opponent plays g6, tries to financhetta that bishop and castle kingside, Go for h4, h5 immediately, try to open up this rook, attack with the rook on g3 as well, and it's going to be a great game. Otherwise, develop as rapidly as possible with ideas like knight f3, knight c3, bishop d3, castling kingside, etc. And just keep the pressure on. Thank you very much for watching this tutorial. Hopefully you enjoyed it. It was highly requested. Hopefully I delivered with my depth that I went into here. And yeah, hopefully you guys had a good time watching it and will hopefully send me uh, some of your some of your wins if you do get any wins in this line my lee chess account is will taylor chess of course um send me your games on there if you manage to win um and i will i'll maybe cover some in a video thanks very much for watching if you're new like subscribe comment uh if you've been here before you know the drill do you know what i mean uh, and i'll see you in the next one goodbye